this right here. Goody goody. I'll do a truncated intro. Yeah, you will be good. I'll show and tell for a minute and then I'll get all my business out of here. And you'll be good to go, right? <clears throat> Juan, are we ready to go? We're recording? Mm -hmm. We're good? Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to DVC Student Center. Uh, special thanks to Juan, Nolan, everybody involved in putting together the space here. Special thanks to the folks at the center and our Dean Obed Vasquez in social science uh, for seeing to it that we also had refreshments, free food, pizza. If you haven't had any, please come and help yourself. Um, watch out if there's any cords. I don't think there's any cords anywhere, so I don't think anybody's going to trip except for over here, right? Cool. Just, Just you. Okay. Um, so, uh, our dean can't be here because he's actually in interviews right now, but uh, also I see Dr. Albert Ponce back there, whom I teach, uh, mm -hmm. with whom I teach social justice, intro to social justice studies. Albert's lucky enough to be on sabbatical this semester, but came over to say hello. Also, Professor Michael Levitin, who's our faculty advisor for the student newspaper. Uh, he's our full-time tenure track, soon to have tenure professor. So, Michael, thanks for being here. Uh, and we uh, are delighted today to have two amazing guests, one of whom also teaches here. So I'm just going to kick things off very quickly, make a few in, uh, introductory remarks, and then hand it over to these wonderful folks who have a lot of important things to share with you and really want to hear some feedback and some commentary from you all today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Mickey Huff. I am a professor of social science history and journalism here at Diablo Valley College. I teach critical thinking, uh, mass media. I also teach modern US, critical reasoning and history, money, power, politics, political economy, et cetera, et cetera. I also uh, am director of an organization called Project Censored that publishes this book every year on underreported and censored news stories at projectcensored.org. So we're just working on our next version of it right now. It comes out every fall. Of course, um, I also publish on a lot of other things, including media literacy. Strangely, something that connects with the topic that we're going to be dealing with here today, right? Also on a history of neoliberalism and our distracted society and how we're a very warlike society that's easily led by propaganda because we don't think critically about what goes on in the world around us. So as you'll see, um, no shortage of books and publications. From my end, I like to practice what I teach. So here we are, uh, 20 years of shock and awe, mass media propaganda and the war machine. Um, we just passed a milestone 20 years since the second illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, that invasion was sold to the American public on a pack of lies about weapons of mass destruction. Colin Powell, the prevaricator in chief at the United Nations, held up a vial saying that, uh, they, that the Iraqis had all kinds of horrible weapons and chemical weapons and so forth and they were prepared to use them on us. Unfortunately, however, he knew what he was saying was false and said it anyway. But that's at least consistent for um, Colin Powell because he kicked off his military career by trying to cover up the My Lai massacre in Vietnam. So he bookended the end of his career by lying about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And why is that important? Well, right now we have uh, in the world uh, Vladimir Putin illegally invading Ukraine. Uh, but we have very little conversation about any other actors that have violated international law, like George Bush and Dick Cheney, who, vi who violated Iraqi sovereignty 20 years ago. While there are cries to bring Putin to justice at the international court, I seem to hear crickets coming from the other side. So this is an, an ongoing issue. Um, and this is partially what you're going to hear from these really experienced folks today talking about the uh, deceptive language that's often used in recruit recruitment for the U.S. empire's often illegal and mostly unnecessary wars. So you're going to hear a lot about that, I think, today. I did bring this in case people are interested in the propaganda history, Weapons of Mass Deception, probably one of the best books on the Iraq propaganda that came out. The Bush administration's chief of staff in August of 2002 told the media that from a marketing standpoint, you don't introduce new products in the summer, right? What he was talking about, the new product was a war in Iraq and within several months into March of 03, they had successfully sold the war to the American public, partially with the help of the Rendon Group, uh, which is a major PR firm and we pay a lot of tax money to them to sell propaganda to the American public through official sources. More on that later, and you're gonna again, you're gonna you're gonna hear, you're gonna hear a lot of, of truth truth bombing here going on today with our guests. 
So our first guest is um, Rosa Leiter to my left. Uh, Rosa is a journalism instructor here at DVC, teaches the multimedia class. Some of you may have her. She's also a freelance journalist, creative writer, musician, and conscientious objector. She grew up in, a rural, in rural Montana where she joined the Army National Guard at 17. A year later, the September 11th attacks rocked the country. Within two years, the U.S. was waging war in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Rosa found herself questioning whether she could serve in an organization whose actions she saw as illegal and unjust. That tumultuous time is the focus of her memoir, that's right up here, Breaking Cadence, One Woman's War Against the War, and her companion podcast, Breaking Cadence, Insights from a Modern Day Conscientious Objector. It is also what drives her to volunteer with Before Enlisting, a group seeking to offer teens information that mili military recruiters do not mention, and you're going to hear a lot more about that. So please welcome uh, Rosa here today. Our other guest is Eddie Falcon, who served for four years in the U.S. Air Force as an active duty enlisted air crew member, completed four short overseas tours, two in Iraq and two in Afghanistan, as well as performed medical evacuations in Hurricane Katrina. Eddie's a California native and moved back to his home state after separation from the military in 2005. He lives in the Bay Area where he received a master's degree in Spanish and has worked in high school education since 2012. Thank you for that. He is currently a board member of Warrior Writers, um, facilitates writing workshops for veterans and civilians, and organizes events for these writers to share their work to the public. We're very glad to have Eddie here to share more of that work with us all today. He also gives presentations to high school classrooms about the realities of military service through before enlisting. And what these folks are going to talk about here today is they're going to talk about the real deal behind what it means to be committing service in the military and how the next generation can help hold the most powerful military on the planet more accountable. They're going to share personal experiences in the armed forces and how the next generation can tackle issues of misinformation and morality when it comes to the media and the military. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. Thanks to Rosa and Eddie, and just a quick reminder that this event is being recorded. Rosa and Eddie, hand it over to you. Cool. Thanks, Mickey. Oh. And thank, you. thank you for being here. Um, it's great piece. Hey, Falcone. And uh, the way this presentation will work is I'll talk a little bit, take some questions. If at any time you have any questions, you just raise your hand. Um, this is meant to be more of a dialogue and discussion-based presentation. Um, and then Eddie will share some of his most poignant experiences as they relate to this topic. Then we're going to show this great mini-documentary <clears throat> that the New York Times put out on the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. Uh, and then, yeah, more discussion and maybe some brainstorming on how you can be part of the solution of you know, <clears throat> engaging in more critical media literacy, trying to hold the military more accountable because it's really hard to do that. They're like, it's like trying to grab an eel. Um, <laughs> it's not easy. So yeah, I'll just start off a little bit about me. <coughs> Getting over <coughs> allergy, I, I don't know what, but <laughs> I'm just going to try to speak up. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, you heard from Mickey about kind of the overarching um, systems and situations that were happening 20 years ago and uh, when I enlisted like 22 years ago now I was um, just kind of starting my senior year of high school and up in the middle of nowhere Montana in a town so small we did not have a gas station we did not have a stoplight um, you know the economic opportunities there were sugar beet farming ranching or getting the heck out of there, which is what I wanted to do. Um, and re the recruiters were invited into our uh, school and allowed, you know, given the floor, allowed to, you know, give us their, their spiel. And, you know, pre-9-11, probably, you know, before most of you were born, <laughs> right, um, the, it was kind of this different world of, you know, oh, things are great, economy is booming, um, a time of peace. And Eddie and I talk about this all the time. Um, the last major war we were involved in was Vietnam, and that was seen as such a quagmire, such a disaster. 
such a mistake, so, you know, so horrible that that was something that country had learned from and we had evolved from and we wouldn't let something like that happen again. So in that nice little bubble, um, you know, the recruiters start coming in and I'm trying to figure out a way to pay for college because, you know, we grew up on welfare and, I, you know, it was a single mom situation and she had absolutely no money to help me even with books. So she had warned me, you know, like, hey, if you want to go to college, you really need to find a way to pay for it yourself. So because I wanted to go to college and because I was already interested in journalism, I've been interested in journalism since middle school, um, I tuned out the, the recruiters who were like, oh, you do your, you do full time army or full time this and that, and then you get to go to college and we'll pay for it. Um, but the National Guard guy, when he came in and billed the National Guard service as, well, this is one weekend a month, two weeks in the summer, this is barely a part-time job, um, you know, it's the National Guard, what's the worst that could happen? You'd be helping uh, fight a forest fire maybe in the summer. Um, I really leapt at that opportunity and that barely part-time job um, expectation that I had in my naive little 17-year-old mind. Um, but then, you know, I went off to college and I, a couple weeks into my freshman year, I was driving to school trying to find parking and um, I hear on NPR um, the first report of the 9-11 attacks. Um, and still so sheltered and naive and, you know, just a little speck of a person, I was like, oh my gosh, in the weeks week that unfolded, the New York National Guard is really going to have a big mess to clean up after this attack. Mm -hmm. I, I still had no inkling that this would affect me very um, deeply uh, and, you know, for, for years and years. Uh, and and um, so as I'm studying journalism, but also in uniform, like I think, uh, you know, that's why we go and we kind of share our experiences because it's one thing to talk about these ideas like in a big way and like the media as a whole, mainstream media got the story wrong, but to hear how it affects uh, people on a, on a personal level, I don't know, some, sometimes it makes it a little bit more memorable. Anyway, so um, by that, I hadn't gotten to boot camp yet because the National Guard lets you do this thing, it's called a split option, and you get to go to school and then you do boot camp one summer, and then you get to go to school the whole next year and you do your job training, your AIT, the next summer. So I knew that I couldn't get called up until I was fully trained. So, um, you know, at first I was just, well, you know, you know, look at Operation, Operation Desert Storm that lasted a, a few months and it was over. I just need to hunker down and, you know, um, there's nothing I can do. I signed a contract. Like, that's legally binding a really big deal when you join the military. If you break that contract, they either throw you in jail or you have to go live in Canada, try, you know, try to hide out for the rest of your life. Um, so yeah, so I just, you know, uh, kept trucking along, but then, uh, being a journalism student as the Iraq war was unfolding, also in uniform, that, that, that was a next, next level. Um, you know, I was paying attention to the campaign, the very rigorous campaign of misinformation being waged about these supposed weapons of mass destruction that um, existed and also the, you know, it was proven false, but the connection you know, they said that Saddam Hussein helped fund the 9-11 terrorists. That was not actually true. Um, and, uh, and everything just seemed so fast, like, we're sending in weapons inspectors uh, to the country. They, they searched, and they were in the middle of searching. They couldn't find anything, so the Bush administration, well, we're pulling the weapons inspectors out. Uh, it's not safe, things are escalating. Um, Meanwhile, you know, I, I'm reading um, opinions and uh, editorials from experts and diplomats and leaders who are saying, you know, this is dangerous, we should not be trying to ramp up to war in Iraq, um, and yet the Bush, Bush administration seemed like this um, steamroller. So, so yeah, that, that's when I started to really start having misgivings about my role in the military as we are 
basically concocting a, a war, an illegal war, and it would turn out to be a textbook, textbook case of an unjust war, which means like a war that's doing more harm than good. It was not, the way it started was not moral or ethical, the way it ended, and, and in the middle. I mean, we, America started a civil war in Iraq. We started a sectarian conflict that raged for many years, and so many uh, innocent people were, were caught up in that. Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, and then, um, you know, um, as we invaded Iraq, I was reading the, the paper, listening to NPR, um, and then, you know, what was it, six weeks later? I've got a picture of this one, actually. This is the mm -hmm. famous, like, mission accomplished! What was this, like, two months later? Bush flies in and, uh, you know, his little jumpsuit lands on this aircraft carrier. On May like, 8th. On May 1st. Right, yeah. Um, combat operations in Iraq have ended. This is 2003. Yeah. Like, six weeks after the invasion of Iraq. Um, <laughs> of course, you know, like, we just got out of Iraq. We just got out of Af Afghanistan. These conflicts raged for so long. Um, here's also another one. The, I, this is a uh, famous, this was on TV all the time. When we invaded Iraq, the, um, the Bush administration and then therefore the media, um, the, the story was that the Iraqis see us as liberators and they're so thankful that we're there. We're doing something really good. Um, that's not true at all. This, this scene right here was concocted by Fox News and the military and they, they were kind of watching the statue for a while and when like maybe one Iraqi um, tried to, to topple it, not, e not a crowd, like they said, oh, a crowd of, you know, victorious Iraqis came to topple this. That's a military, a U.S. military rope mm -hmm. that soldiers put up and they, you know, they, it's staged, they pulled it down, and yet this is like one of those iconic images that lasted for years. Um, I was like, yeah, but we're doing good. You know, m veterans don't join the military to, um, well, some do, to, to kill people and create harm. That is what you're trained. In boot camp, you're trained to kill people. You're trained to use your M16 very accurately. You're trained in combat, hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, and you're trained, you know, how to put on tourniquets in case your battle buddy's arm is blown off, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, nobody joins the, the military with this, you know, um, people join because they're young and they're idealistic. They do want to serve their country. They want to do good. They want to be a helper and everything. And yet they're, they're put in situations that, that really exploit that kind of innocent, um, um, you know, desire to do good and, and serve. That, that word service is supercharged and, yeah. Anyway, so. Uh, Can I say something about yeah. this? Real quick, this picture, I do remember when this happened and you can see people down here, but just about since you guys study journalism and everything, it's like the camera perspective is really important. Like the things that they were showing on TV was, yeah, this square and it full of people and it looked like the Iraqis themselves were tumbling, toppling this down. But when you looked at it from further away, it was completely empty around. And there was maybe only like 50 people in there that they obviously just brought to do this. and. It was obviously, yeah, an American crane, like, and everything, you know, like, um, it was all just staged. It was just very obvious, and it's just, you know, just, just to like show a couple you. weeks after the war six, six weeks. Six weeks. Like, yeah. or, or no, this was like two weeks. The whole thing was after staged the for camera, and yeah. the people were bust in from Iran. They're not even Iraqi revolutionary fighters yeah. or anybody there. A U.S. soldier is actually the one that was helping tear it down and threw an American flag over the statue, and then was quickly told, "No, no, no! You're like, no, take no. that down!" We and wanted he to took make the American it flag down to put up the Iraqi flag. So this is the kind of public relations stuff that I was referring to when I mentioned like the Rendon Group and others. This was totally made for TV. Right, and they they were, they knew that journalists were in town. They were covering this, and Fox News especially, which um, just just materialized <laughs> during the war on terror. Um, you know, uh, it, 
anyway, his, history matters. Fox News was created kind of to sell. They just happened to be sport. there for this spontaneous yes. thing. Yes, and they, they knew, like the military knew, like when the Fox News cameras are there, we need to make something happen because we, you know, and, and of course all the anchors um, back, back here, you know, they have the video, they have images, and they have the story that the military is saying, and so they regurgitate it, they, um, the anchors deliver that, and then it's in everyone's collective conscience and psyche. And it is once news is delivered, and you think you know a story, it's really hard to change that story. Just like um, you know, I can't remember how many times it would drive me insane. Every time that I would hear President Bush speak during a news conference, he would always tie Iraq back to 9/11. Iraq had nothing to do with 9/11, and yet, if you ask anyone today in America, like, uh, why were we at war in Iraq? They'll say, well, because of 9-11. There it is. Like, it's so hard to, to change it. In any, any case, so um, seeing this unfold, I, I, for a long time, I didn't think that there was anything I could do because of that contract. But then I discovered the secret. Also, like, an example of how the media um, was completely ignoring peace activists and, and National Guard soldiers who did not want to be deployed to this. You know, the National Guard, we all thought that we were going to be defending our state against natural disasters, not flying overseas to a country we'd never heard of and um, length, you know, not speaking the language, not knowing the culture. Um, anyway, uh, so I discovered that you can still be a conscientious objector in today's all-volunteer military. You can. Uh, it's it's still kind of the same process as in Vietnam. You have to write a huge um, essay, answer all these questions, be um, interviewed by a chaplain, a psychologist, and then an investigating officer is assigned your case and tries to make you look bad, tries to make you change your mind, tries to dig up any dirt on you. In my case, my investigating officer, you know, told me I was basically a, a, a Ship bag, and that I joined fraudulently, and that I should pay back all the money that they ever gave me. And so, at 20 years old, I'm hiring a lawyer to try to to try to not fight in an unjust, illegal, concocted, bizarro uh, war. Um, and so, so yeah, anyone who wants a book can take one. I have a bunch of copies here. Um, and so, I guess what time? What are we at? You still got about two. Minutes. Oh, and he's timing me. This yeah. is great. <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, you know, I did end up, um, my case ended in kind of limbo. They, uh, you know, at, at the end I was, I had a lawyer who was prepared to sue the federal government on the writ of habeas corpus, which is you cannot unlawfully detain someone unless you tell them what they are detained for. Fun fact. All the people we rounded up, rounded up and put in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib and all of these other prisons, um, people who were maybe wrong place, wrong time, or maybe they were suspe suspected of something small, but they didn't know exactly what to charge them with, they were also being held in prison without any charges, indefinitely. Um, and they, they also were trying to file this, these kind of cases uh, habeas corpus cases. If you are going to keep me, you need to give me a good reason. And so the army, um, the military never told me why they didn't think I was a convincing CO because my case was actually really strong. Um, so yeah, but as I became a, a journalist out in the, the real world, uh, in radio and in TV, it was still infuriating how the war was being covered or actually not covered. The longer it dragged on, the less and less it made the news, unless we came to some kind of milestone, like, oh, 2,000 uh, US soldiers now killed in the, the war on terror. Let's do a story on that. Or, oh, it's Thanksgiving. Let's send the cameras to the troops and see, see them eating their turkey and mashed potatoes. Um, and the soldier homecomings, right? We've all seen those, like, you know, the kid is in school at an assembly, and um, the returning troop member walks in, and it is like, you know, tears gushing, um, super uh, weird, you know, weirdly exploitive, and um, all about the wrong, the wrong messages and the wrong attention. 
in my opinion. And that, th those are like the classic, this is how we cover our military stories now. So we'll talk a little bit later about um, how to be more critical and maybe try to push to get access when, you, when the thing you're trying to cover is kind of closed up like a fortress. But now I want to turn things over to Eddie for a little bit and he'll talk a little bit about his service and I'll show some pictures of him when he was... Yeah, I was going to say, oh, you got those question? pictures. What would the legal war be? You the mentioned an illegal war several times, several times, but what is a legal war? Well, yeah, there's just wars and there's unjust wars. Uh, a just war would be World War II where, you know, Hitler is trying to mass exterminate uh, people and um, an unjust war is something where we preemptively strike, we're like, well, you might have this, so we're gonna, you know, um, stuff like that. There, if you look it up, just war thinking, there are, there's a checklist of like 10 That's circumstances. That's not my question. What is a legal war? A, a war legal that is war. declared by a country. It is considered legal within a country yeah. if it is based on its own constitutional and congressional principles. Illegal war is something that is defined differently, and other countries will disagree that they're fighting illegal wars, but international law says preemptive war is always illegal. Okay. And that would be these, the invasion of Iraq, and that is also why people are talking about the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. So also on a that also here like when they didn't, they didn't you're supposed to have Congress vote to go to war and they didn't do that like Bush just started we haven't declared war since 1941 yeah yeah it was like an authorization of military action it wasn't an actual instead of voting to go to war yeah so the Congress and all that stuff with Iraq doesn't it so this is very technical and this does not you know display my views on the Iraq war. But very technically, because they got a vote from the Security Council, doesn't it count as a legal war on the international level? Technical issues again. I don't believe so. No. Even though the Security Council sanctioned the war. No, the Security Council. The United Nations. Yeah, I'm sorry about the United Nations. I get the present K okay on this. I thought it was sanctioned by the UN. That's when, during the. Oh, there it is. 15 member security council, when they were casting the vote, that's when the U.S. pulled out and said, the vote's not going our way, and we're going to strike. They used their veto, there we go. veto power. All right. Well, they don't need to power. The veto would be saying that You only need one veto on yeah. the security yeah. council to cancel. So. Right. Well, yeah, it would be a permanent vote. Yeah. So there was no sanctioning through the United Nations. It was going to go down to count within but the U.S. Yeah. Even if it was 14, but the U.S. was 14. Yeah, I'll rotate. What kind of member killed the vote? Well, the United States just walked away. They walked away. They walked away from it. They so they didn't even they didn't really do the vote? They were there sitting at the table, and they knew it was going to go. Very issue vote. And did the, we'll have to double check if they actually cast the official vote of, to veto it, but I don't think it was that. Wasn't the reason for it not being sanctioned because it was already like unanimously supported by most people in Congress? No. Um, you know, not in Congress. It never went to Congress, and the United Nations Security Council, the 15 minutes. So there's five permanent members, who are five very powerful nations, the U.S., Russia being part of them. But the others were voting, and I still, I'm remembering that day and listening to it on the radio, and everybody's going down, the vote was going down against it, condemning the United States, illegal, what they were saying, the illegal invasion. So it was the most protested war in recorded human history before the fact. It was not a popular war around the world. It was made a popular war here, mostly through propaganda. Um, two thirds of the people that support, of uh, the 70% of people that supported the U.S. invasion here, erroneously believed that Saddam Hussein was behind the 9/11 attacks. So we did numerous studies of that in 2003 and 4 when I was director of Retropol. Uh, the other issue that's not coming into play here is the fact that we never stopped occupying or flying sorties or bombing Iraq during the entire presidency of Bill Clinton. So. Iraq was not considered really a sovereign state during that entire period because the U.S. and Britain never left. All right. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Wouldn't uh, Congress mm -hmm. probably would have passed to like declare war of Iraq because I know they didn't, but like because of like the patriotism mm -hmm. of like of um, after 9/11, and I know like George Bush, uh, his opinion like after like the 2000 election was like not really good, but then right after 9-11 it shot up, 
because of like patriotism? Wouldn't have like Congress would have just passed it because of patriotism? They had an authorization for the use of military force that was a legal stand-in for a declaration, so they could do what they wanted. Congress handed them a little blank check to bomb who they wanted. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, I, but that I, did happen in for invading Afghanistan. Everyone voted for it except Barbara Lee. Except. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a kind of shift in public opinion, though, around like 2008 or so, around when um, the campaign oh, yeah. for Obama was happening? Oh, yeah. And he kind of like marketed Iraq as, it, he was like, Iraq's bad, but like Afghanistan's good, and like was trying to change yeah. like public focus there? Yes. Yeah, for sure. It was like when Obama was running, you know, he would say, I'm going to take the troops out of Iraq, and when everybody would clap, he would go and put them in Afghanistan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Go we'll watch some old videos. He would do that. He would literally do that. It's like, it's not a joke. <laughs> um, all right, well, I'm going to go ahead and start my talk now. I'm going to time myself here. But um, yeah, I'm Eddie Falcone. I served for four years in the Air Force. Uh, I like to call it the Chair Force because I, uh, I sat in a chair for most of them. Just joking. Anyways. <laughs> It's most it's a joke among military people, but um, this is me in boot camp. Uh, I was 18 freaking years old there. That's when I graduated <coughs> boot camp, um, and yeah, I was heading off into the the go to go serve my country. This was in 2001, um, and I joined the Air Force in July of 2001. And I was on something called the delayed enlistment program, which means you just have to wait to go to boot camp uh, because of your job is hard to get into. Um, so I wanted to fly on planes and I wanted to be air crew, so that's why I had to wait a little while. And so while I was waiting, 9-11 um, happened. And like Rosa talked about, I was a young person. I think I was a little bit naive. And you know, I heard that Vietnam was a mistake and we lost that war and uh, you know stuff like that wouldn't happen again I just thought America was gonna win every war and I mean I knew we had been in Iraq for a short period of time before that before you know Afghanistan started but that was over so quickly um, I, I mean my uh, Taekwondo instructor was in the reserve and he went and he was back in like a week and I was just, I just thought that we would handle uh, this situation that was coming up really quickly because uh, I thought should I join should I not you know should I go uh, but I believed that whoever was responsible for the 9-11 attacks was a small group of people that lived in a cave and the special forces were going to go there and clean it up because uh, that's kind of what the media was portraying at the time it was a very small group of people and um, so I just figured it wouldn't be a big, long thing, let, al let alone know that that war would last for, I don't even know, 12, uh, however many years Afghanistan has been going on. And it's kind of funny to sit here and, you know, we're all kind of discussing, well, when this war, it's talking about it like past tense for people like me who are in the war. The war is forever living inside of you and it's in your bones, it's in your mind, it's in my dreams, like I can't shake it. It's just a part of me and my identity. I try not to make it a part of my identity as I walk around in life. Um, I try to be as far away from that as I can, but it's just it's just always there. It's something that uh, kind of lives in your psyche. The the trauma, the pain, whatever, all the experience of it is forever lives in you. Um, but uh, go ahead. It's all right. Oh yeah, do it. Again. I'll explain this picture. This is kind of a funny one. Uh, there's me, <laughs> and this is George Bush's limo. Uh, so I did a, <laughs> this is one of his limousines. I did, a, he has like three, they have, the president has a few of them, has a fleet. And they all look exactly the same, so you can't tell which one he's in. They didn't even tell us if he was going to go in this one that day. But we moved him, there's my plane, there's my C-130. Uh, we moved his limo, uh, we took a picture in front of it, they showed us the inside and stuff. There's computers in there, there's phones, the football, whatever, you know, it was all in there. And um, it's, uh, this is all bulletproof, the tires are, won't, it won't, you can't puncture them, it's really thick, the doors, uh, it's pressurized in case there's a chemical attack. Um, anyways, um, they told us not to take pictures, but I know one of these guys <laughs> snuck one with his cell phone. <laughs> 
he's like, I got it in there, and it was one of those old Nokia brick phones, so it just looked like a bunch of crap anyway. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so I did my uh, first, like, like Rosa was talking about, you know, I, I was also a poor uh, working class person. My mom's from Mexico. Uh, my dad is Mexican too, but was born in America like me. I mean, you know, he didn't graduate high school. My grandparents uh, worked in the fields. Um, my mom, um, nobody went to college, nobody had a degree, so that wasn't really something that like I, I thought I could do. I went through survival school. I went through, I mean, sorry, I went through, that was later in the military, and these pictures are influencing my brain. Um, I was in, um, I had some, some issues in the, in the home. My dad was abusive, he got on drugs, I had to go through foster care. I had parents that were getting arrested, uh, family that was getting arrested, and I had some family getting deported. Um, people were dying and going to prison around me, and I just thought I wanted to escape that type of cycle of violence and that poverty, and so the military just seemed like a, an escape to me. And I mean, I was really in, in, in this shit. I mean, I got, I, I was in a meth raid, like right before uh, I went to, to, to the military. So just letting you know, like, yeah, there's some people like me who just, I, under, I know I speak in schools and I tell kids, try to tell them not to go and think of alternatives, but there's some people who really just feel like this is their only way to escape. But, you know, frying pan into the fire. Um, so that's me in, uh, I think that's Kabul. I mean, this stuff was like 20 years ago, so I barely remember. But this is Kabul. Um, and this is in Iraq. This is the Iraqi officer exchange. Um, this was when we took, so the, we pretty much took down the Iraqi military. If there, you know, there wasn't anything left. And so these were going to be the people that we were going to train to be the new Iraqi officers. So these people were all um, doctors, teachers, you know, people who had some sort of status in society. And we were going to make them the new officers of America's little puppet military. Um, these are some senators. I don't know if any of you know who they are. <laughs> Senator Dodd or something, Senator Reed. I don't know who they are. Um, but there's me down there. But um, yeah, I moved senators around. I moved these people around. Um, I moved, you know, the, the cargo. I moved the, the president's limo. Uh, but I also moved around um, some, pr I, 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 can't, I don't have any pictures of this because I wasn't allowed to take any pictures. Uh, they told me no pictures because I did carry my camera a lot with me, but they were like, you can't carry your cameras on these missions. Um, I moved a lot of prisoners around. I moved a lot of people from, that were, got collected in army doing raids, kicking down people's doors in the middle of the night, which we're going to see in some of the video that we're going to watch later. But uh, from... Those people that they would round up in the middle of the night, they would get them and they would bring them to my plane and we would take them to the prison in Basra. Now how this would go is they would come out shackled from head to feet like this and we would put bags over their heads or blindfolds or goggles after. The, you guys know about the Guantanamo Bay, I mean, sorry, uh, not Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib. Abu Ghraib, the pictures in Abu Ghraib, right? Um, so after the pictures in Abu Ghraib came out, they were like, okay, don't put the bags over their heads anymore because that looks like what happened over there. So they told us to just use blindfolds. Um, so they would bring them to our plane and they would tell me, uh, you know, put down this thing called Puck Kit. It's a prisoner under containment. And it was like diapers, a tarp, a face mask, gloves, all because they were like, they're going to shit themselves, they're going to piss themselves, they're going to spit, they're going to do all this. And it's like, well, how can they spit with a bag over their head? But anyways, so I just thought that it was not, I, I thought it was demeaning to, to have stuff like that on them, but I knew that wasn't going to happen. That didn't happen. They didn't piss or shit themselves. So I didn't bring uh, that kit. But, you know, they're getting moved around by the army people and they're butting them with their guns. They don't have an interpreter. They're just yelling at them. They don't speak English, the army people don't speak uh, Arabic, and it's, that process in itself is torturous, getting moved around like that. It's, it's a part of the whole thing. And when they would come to the plane, they told me, don't 
put any seats in the plane as well. They literally took the seats out of my plane and the seat belts, and they were like, they're just going to strap them down to the floor of the aircraft, have them sit uh, and strap them down. And so that's what I did. I would strap them down to the floor of this plane here. And, um, and yeah, then we would move them to the prison in Basra. We would have about three planes full of, full of prisoners. These are all men of fighting age. They could be anywhere from like 16, 15 to like 60, 70 years old. They look like they could fight if they were out past curfew. Um, like Rosa said earlier, you know, wrong place, wrong time. That's what the guy in charge told me, the, the non-commissioned officer in charge that was in one of the army police. I asked, who are they? Are they, are they insurgents? Are they terrorists? And he was just like, hey, you know, these guys are just wrong place, wrong time, most of them, and they get interrogated, and um, sometimes they get let go, and sometimes they go further down the line to places like Guantanamo Bay. So when uh, we would move them, it would be about it would be about 70 per plane. So we'd bring about 210 of them in, and then when we get there, we take another plane load out. So another about 200, 210 would come out, and we'd go back and forth. We'd do like three sorties a day, uh, taking people in and out of the prison to get interrogated, and you know basically tortured. Uh, you know you can look up the U.S. government's. Uh, interrogation techniques that they have. They have, you know, softer ones and then they move to harder ones. So, you know, waterboarding, slapping you around, um, you know, uh, get yelling, getting in your face, and then, I mean, all the way up to what you see in the pictures of, in, in Abu Ghraib where they're hooking electrodes up to people and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, that's what I mean by this war lives inside of you. I mean, I was part of that process and I deal with that and the more the time goes on the more I process it the more I realize that was some really fucked up dark shit that I was involved in um, and you know that's not a good feeling and I know people talk about PTSD which is a thing post-traumatic stress disorder I have that too from being shot at and rockets getting you know blowing up in my vicinity which happened quite often having to run for cover fearing for my life taking off from the from the airfield and getting rocketed and um, you know sitting there praying hoping that I'm gonna make it out uh, but you know that that stuff is is traumatizing too but really the moral injury is really what is the really really tough stuff stuff to deal with you know I'm over the loud bangs kind of at first fireworks were really scary for me like people slamming doors when I'm trying to sleep but this other really dark shit that I'm talking about when you realize the stuff that you were involved in and how you hurt people is what really lives inside of you. Um, is there any other pictures? Oh yeah, Hurricane Katrina. Why don't we Katrina? talk about that? Yeah. And so speaking of the, the media and, and the military, it's not just wars, it's also actions at home like evacuating Hurricane Katrina victims. Yeah, so this was uh, during Hurricane Katrina. I had gotten back from what was supposed to be my last deployment, a uh, really hot summer in uh, the Iraq theater in 2005, August or July 2005, because Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005. And so this was me uh, when I first got there to uh, New Orleans International Airport and just sitting around waiting to see what they had for me to do. And, you know, before I got there, though, uh, I remember being at my base, you know, seeing that the levees broke, seeing on TV that uh, people are, it's flooded, a lot of people are left behind, people are going to the Superdome, um, and planes are coming into our airfield in Little Rock, Arkansas, and they're not going anywhere just sitting on the tarmac and they have, they're full of all kinds of different resources, food, diapers, um, a lot of different things and, they're, and I saw planes from all over the world. I even saw planes with things written in Cyrillic. I'm not sure if they were from Russia but somewhere in the Soviet Union uh, or old Soviet Union and you know I was sitting there on, on alert waiting to get called up for like a week. I think like six days went by and then they finally called us up and they said, all right, you're getting activated. So this is a deployment too, basically. It's deployment to uh, 
a disaster in the United States. And I thought, for, oh, for once, I'm going to help people out. Like, I'm going to do something good, you know, is what I felt like. And I was, so I wanted to go. Um, and I'll try to finish this up because I only got about a minute. But, um, you know, it was basically, it looked the same as, as a war zone, okay? Um, you can't see it in this picture. Uh, I know I had some other pictures, but there's a lot of helicopters that are flying in and out and in and out. And these luggage trains are, sometimes they're bringing people back and forth. Uh, and inside, it was a lot of chaos and a lot of noise out here, kind of like how a war zone is. And then I couldn't, I was sitting there for a while and no one was coming to tell me what was going on. So I went inside of the terminal and it was just a really crazy contrast inside of the terminal. It was like completely silent. And there was a lot of people in there that were just like, waiting to go somewhere that got picked up by the helicopters and were sleeping and there was a lot of trash piled up it was kind of stinky in there and you know I got to see how the US was kind of handling this disaster and then they finally found somebody and they're like okay we got some we're gonna you're gonna take a bunch of people and you're gonna evacuate them and you're gonna you know you're gonna take some people out of here so it's like okay cool and so I'm like, let's bring them out. So they bring them out to the plane, and same thing, about 70 people. Uh, this was some of the people. Um, nothing but black people. So this is who our country leaves behind, is what I, like I said, as time goes on, I process things more, I think about them. Um, I got to see, you know, who our country leaves behind and who they don't care about. And being somebody who is a person of color myself, is Mexican, um, I dealt with a lot of racism in the military, being the only Mexican person in my squadron. And I saw the racism against me, the racism against the Iraqi people and the Afghan people, you know, getting picked up in the middle of the night, <clears throat> taken away, deported, displaced, like my family was. And then this, you know, how they treat, how our military treats our own citizens who are also people of color and kind of the, the media around it too, you know, saying that people were looting, people were the people who were left behind and trying to survive. And, and, or and that there were, you know, rescuing them and, and you, you talk about how they didn't know where they were going and they were being dropped Right, out. yeah, they, that's the thing is when we landed, we were, they all just came on the plane, you know, some of them no shoes, just a little bag of some snacks and water bottles and whatever and, um, and I got on this loudspeaker, and they were because the pilots like make an announcement. And so I said, "Okay, hey, we're about gonna, you know, 20 minutes. Put your seatbelts back on. It's like a normal flight sometimes that you guys are probably used to." And I was like, "We're about to land. We're doing our descent. You know, put your seatbelts on. We're about we're coming into Kentucky." And everybody on the plane was like, "Wait, what? Where? Where are you taking Kentucky? What?" But the plane's pretty loud, so we couldn't really have a conversation. But I was like, "Hold on, wait till we land, you know." And then we landed. And um, yeah, the plane's loud, they have earplugs in, but we had to put a, I, I let this baby borrow my headset because we didn't have, the earplugs wouldn't fit in the baby's head. Um, but the, uh, so we landed and they were like, where are we, where have you brought us? And I was like, well, we're in Kentucky, you know, like this is where they told me to bring you guys. And they were just like, ah, oh, like, well. so I remember someone's walking off, like, I think I have an uncle here in Kentucky. And so when you hear about people getting displaced because of Hurricane Katrina, that was it, you know. And that's something that I had to, that I was a part of too. I thought I was doing something good, and I was displacing a lot of people from their homes. Mm -hmm. uh, so think, yeah. Do you have a question? So they were basically left there to be homeless. I, I don't know what happened to them. You know, I mean, there was like a processing center there where the military had set up. But yeah, I mean, they got let. Th we even had one guy in our squadron that let a couple people stay at his house. So it was just during the, at the time around the South, people were like, you know, I think there was a number or something you could call that you could say, hey, you can come stay here if you don't have a place to stay. And that was in Arkansas. So, you know, these people are from um, Louisiana, you know, they're from New Orleans and they got displaced from their homes um, because of, yeah, they just got left there and either in Kentucky or some got taken to Texas, you know. Uh, some got taken to Arkansas, they got taken different places around the South. Okay. And let's not forget that this is the same time when George Bush said uh, he called the FEMA head heck of a job brownie. Uh, the guy who was running FEMA was actually an Arabian horse trader and had no experience in emergency management, yet he was, he was in charge of FEMA during Katrina. Mm -hmm. So. 
So I want to transition to our mini documentary, but uh, you know, that, w that was a lot. So um, any, any questions before we show at least part of this? Was there anything that could have been done that could have like, not, like pre prevented all of this like chaos happening in Katrina? I mean, I, yeah, of course. I mean, I think, I think at the, <laughs> yeah. in the local level. Let's open the can of worms yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> like, open it up. Heck of a job, Brownie. I mean, the local level, it's just like those levees should have been reinforced. Um, you know, there's a lot of hurricanes happen through there. And help should have gotten there sooner. Like, it drives me nuts. Yeah. You're just waiting there, twiddling your thumbs for six days as people are really, I mean, the, the that um, sporting arena. Um, Superdome. The super, the superdome. Super yeah, people were Barbara stuck there Bush's for so long. Barbara Bush's great remark about how great it was at the superdome. Yeah. 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 I mean, people were, you know, it, it was very dangerous there inside the superdome too. It's just like they just dumped a lot of desperate people in there who didn't have anything, so uh, who got everything taken from them basically. And it's like, and the way the media was portraying everything, you know, I mean, that's why. You know, God, God bless him, but, you know, Kanye West is out of his freaking mind now. But, I mean, back then, you know, he was like, this is why George Bush hates black people during the, yeah. during the, the trying to get some rally for some money. So, I mean, that's why he said that, because of the way the media was portraying it. The first people there were, uh, first country was doctors from Cuba. We turned them away because we didn't want their help. Right. Yeah, Because like it's Cuba. Right. Evil comics. All right, so I'm going to play uh, at least part of this because I want to leave enough time to discuss a little bit and then also touch on the truth of recruitment materials we have if you want to be part of the solution and spread awareness of like all, uh, you know, military contracts. They're eight years long. What are your chances uh, if you're a woman of being sexually assaulted in the military? One in four. Uh, <laughs> race, you know, racism, all, all these things that teens should consider before they enlist, and many of them don't know. But anyway, so this is uh, this film, they call it a doc op. New York Times has been doing these documentaries that they list under opinion because maybe they're a little bit <laughs> controversial. Uh, so this, yeah, you'll, you'll see. There are some curse words and some war footage in here. We all talk about how when we're going to go home, how proud we're going to be to be combat vets. I mean, how many people can say that they're combat veterans? You know, 19 years old and I fought in the war. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> Nothing can beat that. That's the coolest thing in the world, you know. It'll be fun to look back on. Just wait to get to that point where I can look back on it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. um, here it is. Oh. Um. Uh, 2003, uh, they got us out here back then, life is hard, got us pulling fucking two hours of guard, then they bump it up to eight between twelve, I don't give a fuck, I think I'm stuck in hell, uh, I'd rather be there instead of jail, put it back there on the map, send me my mail, it's not a moment of day go by that not a thought about back then, never crossed my mind, it may be who I am today, going to a country where you don't know nothing, Knowing it's going down, knowing you're hearing the bomb and the gunshots, it's real now. Like you've been trained for it, they done told you about it, now you're here. That's the worst shit you can go through at the age that we was going through it. Someone smoking a cigarette in the shitters? <laughs> I think we were in Baghdad for a few days and then 
we were in a firefight outside the Abu Hanifa Mosque, and it was just totally bizarre, just you know, fucking gunfire everywhere, a couple of RPGs. And I was just thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> and that question never went away. I don't know how to explain the war to myself, and have yet to have any clear thought of like, yes, we actually made a difference there because we didn't at all. There was no difference fucking made, uh, maybe for the worse. The area I come from is uh, very small. Not a lot of opportunities for people fresh out of high school. So it's either community college or go do something, travel the world, get paid for it, experience places like this. I had swore I'd never join the army. I watched my brother come home all rigid when I was like 12 and I was like, no way. And then he called me and he said, you watching this shit? And I said, what? He was turning on the television. And about 30 seconds after I turned on the television, the second plane hit. When that happened, one, I was mad, you know, I was in my fucking backyard. Um, but I immediately thought, you know, this is what I need to do. I need, I need to, to, to defend my, I, I just felt it. I just had to do it. I had to go join my brother. I had to be by his side. There was no way I was going to let my brother go into a war and me not be there. We'll keep one song back here. Just know where your people are. Well, so we need to start working on what the fuck you mean. That deployment was funny because there was no clear-cut mission. The whole time you're wondering, like, what are we really doing? Are we really in combat? Are we not in combat? Who's actually the enemy? Now you're in Baghdad. Now you're in the heart of Adamia. Now you're, now what? What was going through my mind was, it was dark out and I couldn't see my fingers, basically. I was hoping I still had my fingers. I couldn't tell where I was shot. I just knew my arm was numb. And I found out I had my fingers and I could move them. The doc came by and he was patching me up and we just had a shallow conversation about the, you know, oh wow, man, you got shot. And I was like, yeah. I think I was only 19 at that point. And to be shot in the first two weeks of a 16-month deployment was, was setting the tone, to say the least. IDs are the scariest. Gunfire and crap like that, that shit don't bother me, you know, it's whatever. IDs and that shit in garbage, man, and it could be anywhere. And you ride through the hood and you see a milk jug on the side of the road, but the milk, the milk jug look kind of cut, or a trash bag. The trash bag look kind of ripped up. That's the shit that they will put the fucking bombs in. Heck up! Kill the rock! Possible ID! I see wires, but it's on the surface. Well, I'm trying to surface. We found Coke cans with some plastic explosives in them on the corner. And when you're walking around a neighborhood that's literally being trashed up and down the streets, it's, you can't really tell where they are. You see us when we're going around corners, there's a box on the side of the road. It's just, you know, cringe, and take the turn, and hopefully you don't hear a bang. I still cringe when I pass garbage. I still, my, that's my wife, she goes nuts. I avoid garbage like the plague on the road. I will swerve my car the other side. She's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? We're riding in the open tailgate of a truck, and people are getting fucked up all the time. And we still go out there with it. Part of our $87 billion budget <laughs> provided for us to have some secondary armor put on top of our thin-skinned Humvees. This armor was made in Iraq. It's high-quality metal, and it will probably slow down the shrapnel so that it stays in your body instead of going clean through. That's about it. When we first got here, they were waving at us, uh, and next minute, as soon as we drive by, we'd get shot at. And for some days, they look at us mean and you know, give us checks and gestures that they didn't want us there. When I first got there, I noticed a lot of people doing this to me. Fuck you. Fuck you, America. They didn't say fuck you. They were just... And about four months into it, my interpreter looks at me and goes, Sergeant V, have patience. Wait, what? Have 
patience. We hit houses with the wrong address. And then we have to apologize because we just kicked your door in, or we just blew your door in, or we just damaged your house at 3 o'clock in the morning. side of it now I still carry. Hey. Hey. Hey, you see that in the camera. I'm journalist with that line. I still think about that guy. I still remember punching him in the face. We both this one punching his fucking face. Oh yeah. And it was the last of our theory. If you look and you put yourself in their place, how would you feel if you had someone kicking in your door and you as a man want to protect your family and me coming through the door with bad intentions? Because the intel that I received told me you were a bad guy. I'm always going to carry that. And uh, I'm still working on that. Pick him up, he goes outside the wall. Just like four times shut him. Yeah. He's protecting his house, he gets punched in the face, put on his damn back, ends up in Abu Ghraib and he's never going to get that time back. So I think about that. I don't feel like I'm defending my country anymore, and that kind of sucks. And that's, that's the whole purpose when you're a kid to join the Army. A lot of people are just like, you know, defend your country, and we're not defending our country anymore. I know we haven't defended our country in a while, but I didn't agree with the Iraq war when I went in. I, I was I went in for Afghanistan. I joined to go fight the Melons. I wanted to fight I, I wanted to fight the Taliban. Um, you know, unfortunately, once you join, you have no politics. Your property, you know, you go where they send you. When I was 20, I thought we were invincible. We were kids. We were just invincible. We're going to go here. We're going to do this, and we're going to get out. And I tell people to this day. The day that I grew up was November the 1st, 2003. That was the day I grew up. I think that's the day we all grew up. And you say that day, you just... We just got the call over the radio and that one of our Humvees was engaged with some kind of RPG or IED. Nobody knew what it was at first. It just hit and it hit hard. Our Humvee was limping back to the, to the compound. And we're getting status reports just constantly. And we all just kind of went on with what we had to do that night. And then we got up the next day, and they told us we had a 9 o'clock formation. Nobody told us this why. And I lined up the whole battery. When BC came out, he was, he was already crying. He was really shook up. And we knew something was bad. And he told us that during the night that Jen Hogan had died. And he just, everybody's heads just went down. It was, you could hear the, the gasps and the, and the tears and a lot of people. I think most people really wanted to go out and just kill everybody after that. That was the first death we had suffered in the battalion, and then we had people hurt, but nobody died yet. That's a, really big thing to just
grasp all of a sudden. So the thing you never forget. Several other people in our unit were killed. Lieutenant Saltz, POC Moore, um, Sergeant Major Cook was killed. Um, Sergeant McKeever. Rest in peace, boys. I don't like talking about that shit. That shit is so fucking depressing, man. You just have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. Man. So what does it do to a generation of young people during these deployments? They become old. They are old young men. Yeah, I mean, I feel more grown up. I mean, I've changed a lot the last, you know, year. You know, for people back in the States, it was just a year. You know, nothing really changed. It just got a year older. You know, for me, it was like, you know, a lifetime. You know, I feel like we're up 20, 30 years out here. And every day it was, well, I guess I'm just doing what I'm doing today so that I can get to tomorrow, so that we can get to our 365 days and leave. And then that changed. Then we stayed out there for a few more months. Uh, I think it was like 419 days that we were there. Maybe George Bush should fund my fucking guitar business. He owes me a beer, at least, at minimum. The Iraqis are probably wondering how in the hell are they supposed to believe in a system that we forced fed them when our system doesn't even work. Going back to George I Floyd. Oh, I do Two want words. to keep this part. Not okay. There's actually a picture of me in Time Magazine with my knee on a suspected terrorist chest. It wasn't on his carotid artery. It was across his chest. All these shootings, not okay. Okay, I'm gonna stop it there, just because we're running out of time. Um, so yeah, as part of the next generation of um, you know, critical thinkers, so I, some of you are studying social justice, right, and some are studying journalism. And anyway, you're all here in this room. <laughs> I wanted to, um, yeah, maybe we can brainstorm together a little bit, you know, some of the you know reactions you have or some of the ways that you feel like you might try to hold the media and maybe you know politicians or you know, systems elected leaders more accountable because we're in that place again where it's like oh well we learned from Iraq and Afghanistan we're not gonna let that happen again what a quagmire, what a disaster. Just like, you know, when when we were young, how we looked back on Vietnam. And um, I think, you know, the, the cycle <laughs> um, is probably not, you know, run its course yet. So, I, I mean, seriously, we, we were curious on the way over here, we're curious um, as to what what um, ideas you may have, or like, what, what do you think are some of the answers for, uh, holding media more accountable or even I mean anything. Not repeating the same mistakes. Got a hand up over here. Did you guys ever read uh Condoleezza Rice's like thesis on why we went to Iraq and like what democracy would bring to the Middle East? I haven't read that. So basically when she was Secretary of State they went over it and she went through all of these basic points on what democracy was going to bring to the Middle East and like why democracy was going to just like bring all this peace and that Iraq was going to be perfect after like bringing democracy to it. And I think that one thing that really wasn't like shown was how we were just like culturally insensitive. When we went to Iraq, we didn't really understand like the difference between the different sects of Islam, we didn't talk about Kurdistan, we didn't really look at what, you know, the Iranians that were living in Iraq were doing. 
And so all of these different things were like kind of held, you know, because there was something bigger when Saddam Hussein was there. You know, he kept these things like very much in check because the state was politically stable. But then we kind of just like, you know, supplanted what was, you know, a terrible government, but a stable government. And we gave it a democracy, but we didn't understand these different things and the social structure of Iraqi society itself. So when we dismantle their government, which, you know, suffice it to say, government goes along with social structure. Like, the, the cultural structure of a country also plays out in its government. And when that structure is just kind of like ripped apart completely, there's a power vacuum, and you have these groups that are now, you know, once had something that was keeping them at bay by brutal means, and now they're kind of just like left to do whatever. Because you're not really sure what the the enemy is, right? So it's not like anybody's really doing anything about it, and I think that that was something that we did wrong. Yeah. Right, you're like not knowing maybe what we're getting into, not studying the, you know, the cultures more, the, all the, the different factions, and not, not listening to the experts and the diplomats who are, who are screaming at the government, well, like, I mean, this is a bad idea. Rice was the top diplomat. She was the American. Right, leader. right, and having people in your administrations who are warmongers as well, um, instead of you know saving those roles for people who have a wider perspective. Um, you had a comment as well. So you, said, mm -hmm. you were saying how should we hold the news accountable? Yeah. Given that most people get their news from the news, it's very hard right. to do that. So the only thing that I can think of is social media, because that's a lot yeah. harder to censor. But even then, that's not that has its own problems, and that it's not reviewed, and so nothing on it is very Do you mean like citizen, citizen journalists on social media? Because social media is not a news organization. Yeah, I know. It's because, it's because it's not an organization, that it has that, it's a lot harder to corrupt. But on the other hand, it's a lot harder to keep in check as well. Yeah. So it's easier to spread lies if it's not overlooked. And maybe people's opinion. Yeah, it's like a wild card. I mean, you know, we're seeing it. it it's back in the day, we didn't have as much internet yeah. influence. But right. today, it's true where it's like whistleblowers are a bigger thing because of the internet. And like, that is one thing that can help keep it in check. But at the same time, people can disseminate a lot of lies on and just say weird stuff. Yeah. Got a comment here? I have a comment. <clears throat> one of my thoughts, I think, specifically about thinking about young people in the U.S. considering armed forces. I think that to jump ahead to the media, I'm kind of like where you're at. I can't even put my mind on that yet. But if I were to think about immediately, what could I do to influence? What could I do yeah. to uh, give more information? I'm a, a cheer coach at a high school. So I deal with people in high school, not just in my sport, in all sports, that are considering what do they want to do next with their life, where do they want to go. I have a nonprofit, and that nonprofit is specifically about teaching you how to have more self-confidence to then set goals. And one of the goals is graduating high school, reading goal, higher education. I want to be an EMT. I want to go to the military. And as I'm sitting here, so to explain to bring balance, my youngest child is 19. My oldest child is 29. So everything you talked about, I remember being on paternity leave when 9 11 hit. I remember being at home with my son, my second child, at home with my son. And the news came on, and the first thing I said, I said, that's not true. I told everybody, I said, I don't know what happened, but that's not true. That's what I knew in my gut. I don't know what happened, but that's not the truth, right? So come back to students, like as I'm listening to your story, as I'm listening to your story, the thing I think about immediately is what you said about social media. Are we able, is there something where you say, hey, here's this page that's for um, veterans that have had this experience that they want to share? Is there a website? Because really a, a website is where you have more control, really a page you're not going to have as much control, but some place where testimonies can come, where people can hear what the actual, I heard you say you were 17, and you were 17. I remember being 17 
graduating high school and I was expected to figure out what I was supposed to know I wanted to do for the rest of my life. My frontal lobe's not even closed, right? Yeah, there's a reason why they recruit you in high school. There's a reason. It's the most transformative time of your life and that yet they will try to lock you into an eight-year legally binding contract. At 17. At legally, 17. Legally, I can't have credit. Legally, yeah. I can't buy a car. You can't poke, you can't smoke, you right. can't drink, you can't but rent a car, you can't get married, but you can go uh, right. kill people in another country. Um, I think you can give a, like a brief overview of all the different tactics um, that the uh, Bush administration and the War Hawks used to uh, basically encourage the war. Just like a, uh, you, you touched on some of them, but do you think you could put can, can I back up real quick to what sure. you were talking about? I mean, I think that's another solution that we were thinking of when we were before coming over here is like, getting in, teaching, teaching the youth, you know, like to, about educating them about what really happened. Because right now they think the wars are over or haven't happened. And it's kind of the same when we were younger and Vietnam had just happened. And it was like right before we were born or we don't really remember it. And so I think it's up to, yeah, like you're saying, to educate the youth about what the realities of war are and what, um, and the mistakes that were made and the tactics that you're bringing up that, that they use. But I, and to what a lot of you are talking about, I think one of the biggest things that we have to do is kind of, there's a lot of myths that we have in our society and we need to sort of like demythify like patriotism, uh, veteranhood and supporting the troops and all that because like, you know, it's like one of those movies like they, they live or whatever that movie mm -hmm. was where he puts on the glasses and he sees the the different what the real messages are or whatever or like 1984 it's like support the troops just means like you know don't be shut up don't be anti-war and like things like that and it's like you know I think we put veterans up on a pedestal and we're just people like anybody else and it's like I don't want people to use me or my experience or my life or my narrative to back up politics you know and so we got to like deep, there's a lot of like myth in this country about military and even like, like she was saying earlier, the commercial of the, the kid coming to their parent is at the, you know, at their assembly and surprises them, they came home. It's like, that's what they want you to think about, not what we were just watching. But there is websites you can go to to hear some other testimonies and things like yeah, that. There's Winter to... Soldier. Yeah. Um, and before... our website is beforeenlisting.org. And we'll come and talk to your kids if you want us to, you know. And feel free to, um, my favorite handout, especially for anyone involved in high school education, is this one. 12 questions for military recruiters, which mm. is how you can tell if they are lying to your face. Um, one, how long is my enlistment contract actually for? Because a lot of them will say, oh, it's a two-year contract, it's a four-year contract. No, there, no. There is one contract, and it is eight years long. There's an active part in it and an active part, and also they can change that at any time. Um, you know, number, uh, can they make you stay longer? Well, actually, yes. You are, you are losing so many essential rights, like First Amendment rights, um, just rights of just basic uh, of freedom when you sign up um, that people really should be aware of and yeah, the, the level of kind of hero worship in our country where as a veteran you, you say, oh, well, thank you for your service and you must be an amazing person. Well, some of them are not. I mean, one million Iraqis did not die in a vacuum. Many of them were killed by service members and the civil war that we started and our bombs and our drones. Um, so many veterans are, you know, have, have literal blood on their hands. Um, and, and which was leads to, you know, mental health issues. Number five on here that we ask is what is the rate among suicide amongst veterans and service members? So is it 20 a month, 20 a week, or 20 a day? What do you guys think? 20 a day. Yeah. It's 20 a day. Yeah. Oh, all right, you guys. So, yeah, all that more. Well, I'm gonna get you. <laughs> no, it's more because you asked the question like that. <laughs>